Hello everybody, my name is Kay Mack and I like to do studies of illustrators um, and I like to use it to practice uh, inking and procreate. And I today am using, um, let's see, ooh, fine liner pen. No, let's change that. I want to use comic inker. Yeah, I think that'll be, that's more what I'm looking for. Um, so today I am working with George Harriman, who was the illustrator of a comic called Crazy Cat. And... Um, this is not from Crazy Cat. This is something else. And and <laughs> before we even get started, like if you if you look at like what this is, like uh, and this is like a recurring problem for me with Crazy Cat is like I don't get this joke. Um, the ants, the worms, the wasps, the bees, and they're all like hanging out down here. Um, they say for a revolt against mankind, and they're like pointing to these people who are on a nudist farm. I'm like. What's the joke? What's the joke? Is it that when you're naked, like, you're more likely to get, like, um, attacked by bugs? Is this, like, a, a reference to the Garden of Eden? Like, I, I, I just don't get the joke. And, and this is, like, maybe something that is true of, of like, Crazy Cat 2, um, or as well. So I, uh, I did a, a live stream a while back where I was talking about how, like, I went back and was, like, reading a book that that we'd had as a kid and it was like you know the the comics the uh, like a it was just like a compendium of of early american comics and i was just like remember like reading it as a kid and like sort of like skipping over a bunch of comics and then like so i go, like went back and read it like recently and i was like oh yeah i skipped over these comics because they are um incomprehensible like i i do not understand uh like what the jokes are meant to be like I, I and like they're like they're often written in like a super dense way uh so that they're like just hard to read like and I think crazy cat is like in that category because I think crazy cat was was in that book and uh as as I was doing like research for for this um, episode I don't know that feels like weird to say but as I was doing research for this uh I was like trying to just like read Crazy Cat and I was like this is like again incomprehensible like I don't it's not even just that like I don't get it like because that's definitely true but it's also like the way that he wrote it it is really hard because he wrote it phonetically in a lot of ways I guess like he wrote the the dialogue like like how it sounded instead of like how it's like properly um said also just a side note like he has a really loose style so um sometimes that's kind of hard to to like trace over because he's just like he's moving really fast uh like like these are not like like in some of them like Hal Foster like I feel like like every stroke was like super measured and like like well done but this is like almost like what you don't advise people to do like this just sort of like super fast um like super loose super loose line work but in some ways I kind of like it because it I don't know like the last live stream I did was Franklin Booth and he like everything he did was so labored that I got like half a tree <laughs> but also this doesn't look very good this that line okay let's try this again uh, okay I think he's using like a like a crow quill or something it's like it's it's denser on the bottom. I don't know if I have the right brush for this, but we're just gonna we're just gonna try it. Anyway, so crazy cat, hard to read, um, and and maybe I, I should get into it, it more because uh, it was like I don't know. People talk about crazy cat a lot. Uh, <laughs> that's not true. Just being like, oh yeah, you know, you just can't go to the grocery store without hearing somebody talk about that crazy cat. Um, no, that that's not the case. Uh, <laughs> uh, but like in, in the comic world, if you're like talking about the history of comics in America, like crazy cat is going to come up at some point. Uh, because I think one of the reasons 
Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the history of Crazy Cat, and let's talk about George Harriman. Because um, there, there's a lot to talk about, but it it was a time where, like, so I guess he got hired, and he was hired by um, William Randolph Hearst, who, if you listened to my previous live stream about Nell Brinkley, which you didn't, because I've seen the analytics, <laughs> um, I'm not mad. I'm just happy that you're here now. Um, so he was the one. He also hired Nell Brinkley, who went on to be like one of the, a super famous illustrator. So it, it's like he had good taste, William Randolph Hearst. He like knew how to sell papers and he knew what to get. And so he, William Randolph Hearst, he loved Crazy Cat. He was like crazy for Crazy Cat. Um, and it, it's not even like like Crazy Cat was that big like um it was it was always sort of like modestly successful as a strip and by the end of of the strips run it was only running in like 35 papers and and it's kind of funny like if you like there's like wikipedia articles that are like explaining why crazy cat wasn't more popular and it's like oh it's because william randolph hearst was aiming to a lowbrow audience and they didn't appreciate the high sophistication of crazy cat and i'm like uh, okay. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how well Crazy Cat has aged. Um, but apparently, like, like at the time, like, 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 it, it, it was something that was, like, it was, like, the thinking man's comic. And, and it was because, like, you know, like, if you read, like, the reasons why people thought it was, like, oh, it was, like, surreal artistry. Like, the backgrounds were really, um, unusual. Like, when you compared it to, like, other comics of its day. Uh, he often did things like he would, um, Crazy Cat was actually gender fluid, uh, although they wouldn't have used that word at the time. Like sometimes Crazy Cat was a he and sometimes Crazy Cat was a she. Um, and, uh, he had like really sort of wild backgrounds. Like he was, George Harriman was really influenced by, uh, the American Southwest and he was really, he was really influenced by like... Um, the kind of ar architecture you'd find in New Mexico and the landscapes that you would find in the desert. Uh, he loved that stuff. He loved. He was really deeply influenced by Navajo culture, um, which is a Native uh, American group of people. Um, and so I think, like, when you compared like his work to the work around it, I think just like the art was was one better or more elevated or more colorful. Um, and yeah, cause the plots don't seem that interesting. It was basically like a, a sort of like a Pepe Le Pew situation in that, uh, crazy cat was like in love with like this mouse friend and this mouse friend was always trying to like throw a brick at crazy cat. Uh, and then there was also like a, a dog that was a cop, uh, and the, co the dog cop was in love with crazy cat at the end and sometimes the cop would arrest the mouse and like I don't know I'm just like okay fine if this is like high art that it's it's high art um like also one of the things I read is that like one of the presidents I think it was like Calvin Coolidge like like he wouldn't go into a cabinet meeting unless he like had read crazy cat uh just like okay um and like I've done no research so like this is not like an informed opinion but it's like a lot some of the things that I was reading about like that like that really oppressed people about crazy cat is it's almost like like just by virtue of being like the first person that does it it like seems so new and novel and then then once everyone else kind of jumps on board it's like oh like was that new like like this person broke boundaries but like is the is the work good beyond that like or can other people like break those boundaries the same way and produce like something even better? Uh, and so one of the boundaries that, that he tended to break is that at the time, uh, and and again, I feel like I've, I've mentioned this before that sometimes I like have an urge to over explain things like, cause I'm not sure if, if you, the listener uh, is American. So I'm like, no, oh, I need to explain the American, like the uniquely American parts of this. Um, as if they didn't have newspapers in other countries, but, um, so in America it, for newspapers, like Sunday is a special edition. Uh, the Sunday paper is generally bigger. Uh, it has more coupons. At least it did when I was a kid. Um, 
and it has the comics in color. So it's like the only day of the week that has uh, color comics. And when I was growing up, I guess the newspaper had color every day, so there's no reason that the comics couldn't have been in color every day. And I wonder if they are now. It's been a while since I've like read a physical newspaper. Um, but yeah, so back then, so back when um, George Harriman was, was writing and, and publishing Crazy Cat, he was, I guess, kind of the first one that people saw who would like really push the boundaries of what you could do. Like, like people were used to their comics being just like coming in the square format and coming in the same format every time. And George Harriman was like, well, for the Sunday strips, because they're in color and because I have more space, I'm just going to totally play with the background. And like, sometimes I'm just going to dissolve the boxes all together. And sometimes it's just going to be like a fantasy landscape. Um, and people really responded to like his experimentation of it. Like, like critics, I think were like, I think there, there's one where it's like sort of this really like highbrow interpretation of, of crazy cat where he's like, the critic is like, yeah, this is like basically like you would think that comics themselves are like the lowest basest form of art. And somehow George Harriman is, is elevating it into something, you know, sort of worthwhile and like intellectual and, and um, postmodern and I don't know if postmodern is the right word. We may not be in the postmodern era, but it was like, it was, it was just something that was seen that was like part of something finer. Like it was something finer than the other comics before. Like it was, it was a comic, but it was also art. Like it was like, and good art. Like an, someone made like a jazz ballet based on Crazy Cat. Like, so there must be like, there's must be something about it that just grabs people. And maybe like, I just don't have access to that because it's like so much, like I'm so removed from it in history or like maybe it was the kind of thing where it's like, like if you lived with it every day, like you, it, it got like kind of like a new significance for you. I'm, I'm not sure. Like if, if you're like a, like a big crazy cat fan, like, like let me know what it was that you liked about it. Um, yeah. And so like in the description of this, so that's like, that's one aspect of crazy cat. Like, so it's just sort of like that it was so well received and, um, yeah, William Randolph Hearst was like its biggest champion. And so it's like by the end of its run, like I mentioned, it was running in 35 papers, which is not a lot. And, and they were paying George Harriman as if it was a like marquee strip. And, um, I think George Harriman, like, he realized that, like, he, this, you know, he's like, this isn't running in a lot of papers. You guys do not have to pay me this much. And William Randolph Hearst was like, no, I love that crazy cat. Like, I gotta have it. Like, and, and he was, like, really insistent on, like, keeping, paying George Harriman, like, this, this, at the time, like, really significant salary for a comic. Um, but there's sort of like there's there's some other aspects of of George Harriman's life that I want to talk about to and it it feels like especially significant today to talk about it because in the United States we just um today was the day of the presidential inauguration and um the vice president was inaugurated and the vice president is her mo her mother was from India her name is Kamala Harris and her mother was from India an immigrant from India and her father was an immigrant from Jamaica. So she is uh, someone who, you know, has claims to two racial heritages. And she's uh, a woman and she's taking like, this is the highest office a, a woman has ever held in America. And, um, you know, Barack Obama was there. He was the president before Trump. And he is also claims to two racial heritages his his mother was white and his father was uh from africa american citizen though no i mean barack obama i don't know about his father i'd, I'd have to look that up uh yeah so it's like we live in a time where where like those sorts of things happen like someone who is openly uh known as being i guess mixed race i don't know if that's like the right term for it or like if that's the term that people who are mixed race want to use but it's sort of like it it's not st that status isn't stopping them from um achieving sort of the highest 
political office in the land. Like it's it's like you can't have much more power than that. Um, and George Harriman was also mixed race. So he grew up in uh, Louisiana and his parents were uh, mixed race Creole. And these have, and again, if I'm using the wrong terms, please let me know. I'm so sorry. Like, like I'm, I'm repeating what I've been reading on Wikipedia and I don't want to like get it wrong, uh, but I might. So just that caveat. Uh, yeah. So he, he was born mixed race Louisiana and he was born in 1880. Uh, and okay, so there there came a time in American history, like this is 1880. It's it's not too long after the end of the Civil War, and so in American history, that's like a period of time after the Civil War is like Reconstruction, where it's like okay, we got to put the U.S. back together again. We've got to like figure out how to do this you know it's like we had all these enslaved people and now they're not enslaved people so like what does that look like and how do we like have a country where we have people who used to think who used to own other people and people who were owned like like there was a lot of like soul searching going on I think and um I didn't quite realize the significance of it or that like 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 how much um this particular supreme court ruling like impacted things so it's like George Harriman, he's he's 16 years old, or 18, 16. I think this was in the ruling was in 1896, if I'm remembering it right. And it was a ruling called Plessy versus Ferguson. And what Plessy versus Ferguson did was it uh, gave legal permission for the doctrine in the United States that became known as separate but equal. And it basically said that you were allowed to um, have facilities and um, you can decide who comes in to them based on race. And these weren't just like private businesses. This would be like bus lines, schools, uh, trains, those kinds of things. And and the reason that, that Plessy versus Ferguson was a case at all is because there was a guy named, and his last name was Plessy, and he um, was also from New Orleans. So it's like, I think George Harriman must have been known about this case because it, I mean, it was a New Orleans case. It was about, um, so Plessy uh, was on, the, on a train or a bus or some sort of public transit and he wanted to ride in the white car. And so that, that was a time where it's like, even then, like things were segregated, like races were kept separate. And in in New Orleans, at the very least, and um, Plessy was, and the Wikipedia article uses this term, and I don't know like how people feel about this term, but it was like they called him an octoon, and what that meant is that he was one eighth black or African American or ho- however you want to say it. Um, so that meant he had like a grandparent that was black. And he said, listen, this is unconstitutional. You can't tell me I can't ride in this train car because, like, one of my grandparents was black. And uh, the it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, yeah, you can. You can say that if someone had a black grandparent, they can't ride the whites-only train. Um, and if you have anything, you, don't, you can separate people on race, and that's totally legal. Um, and so George Harriman, he's... He's 16 when this happens, and he's from New Orleans. And uh, what that meant, and and so I guess he had the word colored on his birth certificate. And what Plessy versus Ferguson did is that, like, people who were, um, could lay claim to more than one racial heritage, people who were mixed race, they had to choose. They had to, like, be one or the other. They, you know, couldn't, they're like, mixed race, that's not a thing. Like, you can't, you can't do that. You have to be, either be black or be white. And it's, it's like, what are you going to choose? Like, they, the, the statute says separate but equal. But in reality, the, the, the resources for non-white people were infinitely worse. Like, they were chronically underfunded. Like, the, re- the you know, it's like if, if the white people had a bus, like, the, the, the black people had a bus that was, like, 
20 years older and broken down. Like they were not, they were separate, but they were not equal. Um, and it just sort of like gave permission for people to like be ov overt, like even more overtly racist or, it, you, I mean, it's just like, this is like a devastating Supreme Court ruling. And like in the Wikipedia article about it, they're like, yeah, this was, this is widely considered one of the worst Supreme Court rulings of all time, just because of like the tremendous harm that it caused to people in America. And so then here's here's poor George Harriman. He's 16 years old and he's white passing. Like he can pass for a white person. So that's what he does. He becomes white. Uh, and he's able to, you know, he, he wants to pursue his dreams. He wants to be an artist. He, he moves out to California and then like hitches a, a freight train to New York and becomes a, a sign painter. And then he gets hired uh, to do cartoons at like a paper. And then, you know, then he's, he gets picked up by William Randolph Hearst and, and then he's, you know, and then he's, he's doing Crazy Cat. But the thing is, is that he can't tell anyone about his, his mixed race heritage. He can't own his, you know, sort of Creole past. He like, he, he hides that all and he literally puts it under his hat. He, he has hair that he, um, thinks is kinky, which is like a code word for African American or black. And so he wears a hat like every day to hide his hair and he cuts his hair really short. So nobody knows. And I mean, that's just so tremendously hard and so tremendously sad. Like it, it's not easy to hide a part of yourself. And especially if, if say all your coworkers are white. Um, oh, this looks cool. Gosh, he's so like his strokes are so quick. Like is this like I felt like I did this in like no time at all. Um, but yeah, so I guess like the thing was is that he would wear the hat and he had like a darker complexion. Um, and so one of his coworkers was like, "Haha, we're gonna have a funny nickname for you. We're gonna call you the Greek." And I don't know. I just like I I, I wonder how he felt about that. Like I wonder how he felt like like if if he was worried about being exposed if he thought he could be exposed. Um, there's a, there's stories where he's like, wishes that he was born Navajo. Like where there are strips where that it, it seems to be like favoring a white identity and that like when Crazy Cat is white, like there's more love for Crazy Cat. Um, I don't know, it's just like it, it messes with someone to like have to hide themselves and to not be able to be themselves and I can only imagine that his like co-workers were were like probably said some really terrible stuff about people of color or black people um and I mentioned this I mean one because it's part of George Harriman's history um but two because it's like it's not part of like so last last live stream I did was Franklin Booth and he would have been a contemporary of George Harriman and and in George Harriman's Wikipedia, there's like a whole section on race and identity and like what he had to go through. And there's not anything like that for, for Franklin Booth. Like that's like a, a stress that Franklin Booth didn't have to live with. That's like not something that we have to talk about. We don't have to talk about Franklin Booth's whiteness. We like, it's, it's implied, like it, it's not a secret. And, and for George Harriman, it was, and like on his death certificate, I think it, like he it was he was listed as Caucasian and it didn't come out that his heritage um was mixed race or Creole or he was until the 1970s when like it was discovered by a biographer and it, and that's like pretty difficult too I think if if it's like I feel like I've talked about this in other streams but if trying to think of the way to phrase this because I, I don't want to talk for like people of color like I don't want to I don't want to say this is how you should feel about this or this is how they probably feel about this or um but I do know it's like when I'm doing these streams and I'm, I'm looking for illustrators like from the past and you look at the illustration hall of fame and you you look at um who's illustrated newspaper comics and you look at who um, has illustrated comic books and especially like 
from say the golden age of comics as they call it or even the silver age of comics as, as they call it like it's a, it's a really white field like it's it's almost like exclusively white people it's almost exclusively men um with and there are exceptions um but and then when you ask why and if the answer is oh because there was a law that said that people of color couldn't participate in in white things like there's a law um that's so painful for all for i think for everyone i mean and like especially people of color and if if you can imagine like being a kid who is mixed race or or black and and you want to do those things like if you if like a kid born in the 1930s had known it was possible for people to like see a work by someone like George Harriman and think it's genius like it's encouraging like it means something to see people who are like you succeed um yeah i it's it's not i mean now like again like talking about Kamala Harris and and Barack Obama it's not the same like there's there's opportunities like George Harriman wouldn't have had to wear a hat he wouldn't have had to laugh along when someone called him the greek like like it those things wouldn't have happened to him so it's like I don't know if there's such a thing as progress, but it's like, I, I, I yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to speak for, I don't want to speak for how people should feel about it now. But just like, sometimes the history of illustration and comic in America is painful when you, when you see who isn't there. When you're like, who, who else, like, what else could we have had if, if we could have had everyone at the table? Like, what else could we have, like? Like, what stories are we missing? Like, and why are they missing? And like, how can we make sure that they're not missing anymore? Um, I don't know. This is kind of heavy, but like, today feels a little heavy just because it was the presidential inauguration and like American politics have, have been like turned up into, to 11 <laughs> recently. Um, and, and especially it's like, the issues and, and talk about race in America has been so prominent. Um, and some of the things that Biden said in his, his inaugural speech were, were sort of like, these aren't new issues in America, like white supremacy and racism and like discrimination. Like th these things have long roots in America. And like George Harriman is an example of, of what that is, uh, or like someone who had to live that, that kind of life. And, and, and Franklin Booth is an example of someone who didn't. Um, yeah, I I do I am glad that that comics are and illustration are much more accessible now. But uh, I think it's like it's worth asking the question of like who are the George Harrymans of today and like who are the people that are excluded from this art form and why like, why why are they excluded? Uh, when George Harriman was working, uh, the the media scene was a little bit like it is now. It's like consolidated in, in, in New Hampshire. Um, um, William, William Randolph, Randolph, Randolph first was a taste maker. Like, like, like he decided, decided. He was like, was one, like guy, one guy. He wanted, he wanted to print what got, got printed. It it was it was like now now we have the internet. Like now there's there's in some ways like. Democratization, democratization of access, of access. Yeah, and in some ways not because like so I'm live streaming this right now um, and so that means I have connection to an internet I have a computer that can run a live stream I have the ability to create a YouTube account um, I have a tablet I have a pencil I was able to buy procreate I have the, the internet literacy to find uh, high quality images to practice from and most importantly I have the leisure time to practice uh, so it's like you, you have to ask yourself if you're asking the question of who's missing from this field and why it's like who doesn't have those things who doesn't have access to the technology who doesn't have access to um, the internet who doesn't have access to the leisure time 
and and it, uh, asking these questions is hard because it's like you feel complicit in some ways that you have access to these things and, and other people don't and it's like a lot of the discourse now is like if you do have access to things it's your responsibility and your duty to help other people have that same access who are like barred from entry and then on the other hand you're like how how do i do that how do i help people get access to this stuff it's like do i buy someone a tablet like do i contribute to a charity like 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 what is it and it and it's now that I, I, as I say it out loud, I'm like, is that just an excuse that I just don't know how to do it? Like, it, should I be doing more? Um, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, sorry to get so heavy. Like, sometimes I feel like these live streams are funny, and then it's like I come in today with all this like soul searching. But I guess, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's so, it's something that's that is always on my mind with these live streams because, especially because I'm. Um, focusing so much on illustrators of the past eras and and part of the reason I'm doing that is selfish because it's like I feel like I'm a lot le less likely to like get someone to like copyright strike my work if or like my videos if um, I'm using artists that whose work could like is like feasibly in the public domain like depending on when it was printed or like it's not still like under strict license from someone so it's like if I do stuff from like the 50s and previous I feel like I'm safer in that way um, even though I would like to do some I would like to do modern people but one of the things that comes with that is like I, every artist that I featured besides Hirohiko Arakai has has been white and that's because when I'm looking for illustrators from the 50s and prior it's like those are the people that had access to the kind of media that gets saved um there there are illustrators and comic artists that i have found that are not white um i want to do jackie orman i'm waiting on a book from the library i've been waiting for a really long time for that one but it's like say the difference between so jackie orman was was a a, a black lady illustrator um think around this era not not this era but like the the maybe the 50s and 60s i'd have to go back and, and like look i think she had a strip in the 30s and then she again she had a strip in the 50s and um but so like the difference between jackie orman and hal foster is that like hal foster is archived in a way that jackie orman isn't like jackie orman um wrote for really small papers or sh she drew her strip for for small small papers so there's like less less of her material around and 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 it and people didn't perhaps think to save or see the value in like saving her originals so like like Hal Foster has has like pages and pages and pages where people have like sold and resold his original artwork for lots and lots of money so there's like a value that comes from that he's been canonized in a way that that other artists haven't and and I'm not saying like like now there are artists of, of like every stripe and color um, that are that are producing work and and I I'm, it is my hope that a hundred years from now some of those artists are canonized and their work is um, saved and and appreciated and like you have to pay a lot of money to buy it and people collect it and um, or as I should explain what I mean by canonized but um, it's like if you've ever like taken a a, a literature class. Uh, like I, so I took like early American literature was a class I took in college and it's sort of like there's like a canon there's like a there's like a, a list of books that people are like oh yes this is what we mean when we say early American literature and just by saying that kind of thing like just putting that kind of stuff on syllabi like more of those books are printed more of those books are read like people remember them and they're like oh that was a thing I read so it must be like important I guess we'll keep producing it like like, th like, works can get a momentum. Like, we're never going to get rid of The Great Gatsby. Like, people are going to talk about that book forever. Um, because people, there's already so much, like, intellectual capital built up around something like The Great Gatsby. Uh, and, and it's often the case that I find that uh, people who are white, especially in American, like, American canons of art, like, they've been canonized for a really long time, and, and people have spent a lot of time and effort talking about um, 
who they were and that 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 gives their work momentum that that has not been given to other artists and and then you start to lose those those originals like even if you wanted to go back and like include Jackie Orman like we we we've already lost her strips we we've, we've lost the originals we we've, we've lost those things that that we say so carefully for others so it's like when I say in a hundred years from now, I hope more um, creators of color are canonized and, and saved. And I, I think that can happen. It just takes time. And so then it's like we get periods of history where where there are voices that are missing. And it's just sort of like, ah, oh, that's a shame. Because they, they were, there are stories that we could have loved and, and learned from. But again, I'm also like speaking about this from a white perspective and I know that that's not always helpful or like necessary or wanted um, because it's like white voices have, have had their day uh, so if I'm like being a jackass like just leave a comment and let people know um, but I also don't want to like not mention it I feel like that's that's another evil is to like pretend like this is normal that there's only but if you look at the Illustrator Hall of Fame, it's like, why aren't there people of color in these early years of illustration? And it's like, it's important to know the answer to that. And it's important to like, keep a lookout for the people who, who are excluded today. And yeah, I don't know. Again, sorry to get so heavy. I mean, I've been watching, I was watching the inauguration all day. So maybe it's just kind of in my mind. It's like, People kept talking about how Kamala Harris is like the first female vice president. She's the first vice president of um, like Indian and, and black descent. So I just, it, it felt so appropriate to talk about George Harriman today. Like, like, and to be able to say, well, look, like, look how, look how far we've come and, and look how far we have to go. Uh, it's like, it, I don't think it'll ever be fixed. Like, like those kind of painful memories. I mean, Plessy versus Ferguson wasn't even 150 years ago. Like it, it, it's not so far in the past that it's forgotten. Um, and it was never overturned, Plessy versus Ferguson. It was it was sort of like like the the main part of it was overturned with another Supreme Court ruling called Brown versus the Board of Education and that was in the 50s I think I'd have to look up the exact year and that that was like you can't segregate schools anymore you can't do it you have to you have to desegregate the schools and that was its own like huge kettle of fish but um, yeah so George Harriman I I'd like to think he was happy. I mean, that he was pleased with his work and the reception that it got. I just think it's probably really tough to have to, like, hide a part of yourself. Or to think a part of yourself is less is less than. I have to choose. But, okay, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop being maudlin and, and talking about that. Um, let's talk about this tree. This, kept, this is pretty cool, like... Like, he really does have, like, this sort of, like, really breezy, easy way of doing it. Like, I feel like he, he was producing a, a lot of work. Um, and I think with a crow quill pen, I think that's, like, important. Important? I think that's important about it. Like, I, I, I think he only has one pen. And, and I've been, um, really, I, I really like... This, this pen that I'm using. It's, it's the Comic Inker by Ram Studio Comics. And, and I, I, it really works for this like style of illustration. Like it gives that nice thick thin, it gives like those sort of um, ending lines. I, th I think it's, it's not quite right for this. Like the, the ends get too fine, but that's okay. I'm still like doing a lot of work on trees. I mean, I'm doing a lot of practice. I'm actually proud of myself for how much I'm practicing. Um, I feel like I'm making progress and getting better at drawing. But kind of the funny thing is, is that uh, I've been like, like I've been doing all of this so I can get better at like comic style inking. And then like the way I've been practicing is like really fine art. 
style. So I'm like, I have all these drawings that like are really nice, like, like basically the equivalent of like charcoal sketches. And I'm like, wait, I'm going in the wrong direction. This isn't what I meant. Um, I was trying to do something else, uh, but that's okay. So I always feel like when I like am trying to draw in a particular style, I always end up like doing the exact opposite of that. So it's like, okay. I think the important thing is just to keep practicing. Also, hilariously, you guys, good news. Uh, my subscriber count has doubled. Yeah, pretty impressive, I know, right? Um, I've gone from four subscribers to eight. Isn't that crazy? Oh, sorry, isn't that nuts? Isn't that crazy, cat? Um, it's definitely one of those things where, uh, I don't know, I just don't have it in me to do the hustle. Like... I think, like, one of the easiest things I could do would be to have better thumbnails for these videos, and I'm like, oh god, too much work. Like, I really only want to do this if, like, it's fun. And so far it's fun for me just to, like, not put a lot of effort into, like, the marketing side of it, or, like, the production quality, which is probably will limit, really, does really limit the audience, but... What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? I'm kind of surprised at how much I like this style. Like, uh, I feel like like someone like Hal Foster is is so restrained in the way that he does this kind of stuff. Where it's like, but here I feel like I'm just I don't I don't feel bound to like make perfect lines. I feel like I'm okay to just to do like really casual lines and like really quick shading and like um, stuff I wouldn't normally associate with sort of like inking uh but maybe that's just because of the people that i've been like practicing from like look how fast look how fast this is going especially compared to the franklin booth one um i still really like his work franklin booth and uh, and i have now a new appreciation for crazy cat i should probably read it again i don't know it's just tough Oh, I see. I'm looking at this right here. Um, where I'm like, what's that line doing there? It's like, oh no, I started drawing another tree. Now it looks weird. Um, I always kind of keeping an eye on what I'm going to post to the gram later. Is that uncool to say the gram? I feel like that's something people do in advertisements. Or like if they're trying to like advertise, like, oh, do it for the gram. And it's like, shut up. Nobody says that. <laughs> I do have an Instagram though, KMac Draws, if you're into it. I did when I was looking through the Crazy Cat stuff, I was like looking for the strips that had like these sort of like, people kept talking about how Crazy Cat had like these wild or sort of like super desert inspired or Pueblo like style housing and, and I just it was really hard to find the strips that like like had the stuff that they were talking about um, I don't know if it was just like more in the background or if it was like I need to like look at the Crazy Cat collection I do appreciate like what like his his use of, of scenery though like even just this tree but like the stuff I could find it's like I've been to that part of the world I've been to the California desert and there is something about it that's like so compelling um I spent uh I went to Death Valley before the pandemic and um I just fell in love like it was just beautiful it felt like a like an old place like it felt like an like an an old old landscape um I, the way i described it to people was like it it, it felt kind of like your grandfather that wasn't afraid to slap you upside the head if you did something dumb um not that my grandfather ever did that but just like like death valley is is like a place that people can die because like the the weather is so extreme so if you're not american death valley is has had some of the hottest recorded temperatures on earth um, 
I think it's been up to like 130 degrees and if you're not American I apologize I I don't know the conversion uh I, I, yeah I don't know the conversion I'm like you can pry Fahrenheit out of my cold dead hands I will never learn Celsius never <laughs> um I don't care how reasonable it is I don't care how reasonable the metric system is I like inches I like miles I like feet even if it's hard mathematically um, there's a, there was a great documentary, like a European documentary about, um, like the effort to get everyone to like use the same standard of measurement, which was the metric system and like kilograms and centimeters and, and all that business and how like, uh, they were like, and like the guy who was supposed to convince Thomas Jefferson to like go along with it and get everyone to do the metric system like died on his way to go see him so like the US just like never got on board and like the the documentary is obviously european because they're like and then the whole world was united and i'm like except us except us jerks who decided to stay with our own system of measurement just to be difficult um I wonder if I could just fake this tree. I guess I could. I guess tre trees get kind of bigger as they go to the base. Huh, this actually kind of looks alright. Maybe I am learning. Look, Ma, I learned how to do something. I faked a tree some grass and I think that one has such a strong shadow there this one's gonna need it too it's gonna like leave a shadow behind this tree and there's gonna be some shadow under there and some shadow there huh yeah look ma that's not quite right let's get just a little bit darker over here I mean, it's obviously not as good as George Harriman, but then I'm not the expert. Okay, let's connect it just a little bit more. Okay, I think that's pretty good. I mean, I feel like I've like reached a reached a conclusion. This seems reasonable. I could post this on Instagram. I'm sorry to get all serious on y'all, but uh, I think it's important. I think it's important to talk about that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, if you're if you're ever like looking to create a collection of things like look who's there and look and look who's not and ask questions about why the people who aren't there aren't there like what's preventing them what are the barriers can you help is there something you can do um can and yeah that that's what i would say heal the world all of that business i hope everyone is well if you listen this far thank you i i can't tell you how much um i enjoyed just knowing that maybe i talked to someone for an hour um because I worked at a marketing agency, I'm contractually obligated to say like, comment, and subscribe, as annoying as that kind of thing is. And yeah, enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks for spending some time with me. I'll catch you later.